this for us. So Sid Burst, then one of our two speakers today, he's uh, retired from California Community College System as an instructor and administrator. He is currently a full-time lecturer at Cal State University San Bernardino in career technical studies. He is a student of the desert of desert aviation, military, and military history. He enjoys sharing what he learns, fortunately for us, by giving presentations such as this one. He has spoken here before talking about the history of aviation, the Coachella Valley, and the Salton Sea, and I'm glad he's back to talk to us about the Dorton Bomb site today. And he's uh, his cohort with him today with Mr. Steve Cook. Uh, Steve is and grew up in Nebraska. He enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1960. 69, serving until 73. Steve, thank you for your service. Uh, following his service, he entered the University of Nebraska, where he would graduate as a mechanical engineer. Worked from ATAG in the engineering department for 30 years, and retired in oh, 2005. He is, fortunately for us, retired here in the desert, and he is one of our volunteers. He heads up the uh, B-17 crew on Mondays, he also serves in our technical services department. He does a lot of things. A lot of the displays that we have here are because of Steve's effort. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I want to welcome our speakers. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're here today to talk about the Northern Bomb site. And uh, I'll cover the historical aspects. And Steve is a technical expert. He's going to go over a little bit about how it works. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm strictly the history part of it, so don't ask me any hard questions. Yeah. Here's the Norton Bomb Site, sometimes referred to as the legendary Norton Bomb Site. It comes in two parts. The stabilizer stays in the airplane, and the head, sometimes called the football, comes out of the airplane. And we'll talk more about that later. So we're going to talk about Carl Norton, the uh, gentleman who did this. We'll talk about some of the facts and fallacies regarding the Northern Bomb site, how it works, he's going to do that, and what it was and wasn't, because there's a lot of misconceptions about the Northern Bomb site. A lot of myths have been, if anything, they've grown over the years. And then the doctrine of precision bombing, which is the reason the Northern Bomb site was hyped as much as it was. So Carl Norton, we'll talk about him and his business. He was born in the Dutch East Indies. His parents were actually missionaries. And he had a real strong Christian background. He graduates from mechanical engineer at a classical uh, school in Sweden and promptly emigrates to the U.S. In 1911, he was hired by Sperry Corporation and he worked on uh, gyroscope projects for the Navy. And he and Sperry didn't get along too well because they both were mechanical geniuses and there's, you know, the eagles that go with that. So. Uh, in 1920, the U.S. Navy asked him to design a low-altitude low bomb site for use in airplanes such as the PUI, and he agreed to do it. And he delivered the first one at the 24th. In 1928, because Carl Norton wasn't much of a businessman, the Navy suggested he partner up with somebody who was, and they arranged for him to meet his partner, Barb. So he worked with the Navy in development of the bomb site over several versions. And he came to love the Navy and hate the Army Air Forces. And this is going to come in later, but I couldn't really determine why he hated the Army Air Force so much, but I came across one passage where it said that he tried to get them interested in unmanned aerial vehicles and they treated him like a crackpot. So, you know, talk about being ahead of your time. So, back to Fallon. The Norton bomb site was the second most closely guarded secret of World War II after the atomic bomb. That's true. In fact, it was closely guarded. In fact, every night, or every time the airplane came back, the, the head of the football was taken in a canvas bag under guards and locked up in a vault. This was the security of the thing This is a physical class of a number of good pictures of this class of Bombardier graduates from Bombardier School. So here's the Norton bomb site, covered in bag. Here's the guards. Anytime the bomb site was out in the airplane, it was guarded by two soldiers with Thompson submachine machine guns, as you can see here. And this gentleman is administering the oath where these volunteers agree to protect the secret up to giving up their life if they have to. So that's how closely guarded it was. But the big problem was, it wasn't a secret. This gentleman right here, 
Herman Lang was worked for Norton, and he was actually a guy in the world Nazi. He was one of the first Nazis when the party began. But he was somehow got to the United States, somehow got to work for Norton. So he drew hand copies of the bomb site, smuggled it to Germany. The Germans bought, built a mock-up and decided their bomb site was better and a lot easier to use. So from even before the war started, the Germans knew all about it. So all of this secrecy was for naught. By the way, he was later, this is the FBI mugshot, he was later arrested as a spy and sentenced to 14 years in prison. Now, okay, the second thing was that the Northern Bomb site was always top secret. Well, before the war it was, but as soon as the war started, the logistics of requiring everybody who came in contact with the bomb site to have a top secret clearance wasn't doable. So steadily throughout the war, the secret clearance dropped, and by the end of the war, it was the lowest uh, uh, clearance restricted. Another fallacy was the black little spider webs were used for the crosshair. And along those same lines, supposedly this lady donated her hair to be used in the government actually was looking for long, blonde, unspoiled hair because they used to get it from uh, the, uh, uh, the the Nordic states, and with the war they couldn't get it. So they were advertising for long, blonde hair, but not for the Norton bomb site. It was used in other meteorological instruments because the blonde hair is extremely sensitive to the Now this lady had hair hair down to her knees, and she. Actually, she wore a curl around her head and they called her the queen. That was her crown. But the problem was, oh, before again, this is a uh, card sent to her from Major Farabee, who was the bombardier who dropped the bomb on her team. And he's saying, you know, thank you for donating your hair. This is a letter from President Ronald Reagan saying the same thing. But the problem was, see in this letter here, she didn't even do donate any hair until November 25th, 1943. So the war has been going on a long time. And there's been a lot of northern bomb sites made and before she even donated her hair. So that's quite a myth. So the cross there, the red were actually etched on glass. And this is a comment from this book by this gentleman, Albert Pardini, who's considered the go to guy for the northern bomb site. He's talking about this uh, myth of the black widow, black, black widow spider webs and the blonde hair. And he's saying that as early as 1932, when Carl Norton, Norton took out the first patent, that they were etched in the glass. They were cut with diamond etching wheels. And uh, the Army Air Force publication about the Norton bombsite said the same thing. The biggest fallacy was you can drop a bomb in a pickle barrel for 20,000 people in the northern bomb site. With the, with the optics that were in the bomb site, you couldn't even see a pickle barrel, let alone drop a bomb into it. If this persisted, and you know that old story, if you tell a big enough lie often enough, it becomes the truth. So that's what happened. Okay, the northern bomb site, how it works. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Steve, and he's going to tell you how it works. No photographs. No autographs. I'm just kidding. I hope you know that. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read some of this real quick, if you don't mind. You see the bomb site there? It's attached to its stabilizer, and there's another piece involved that's very critical to flying a precision bomb route. So it's a tachymetric analog computer. In other words, it's mechanical. There's over 2,000 parts in here. Okay, about a few tiny gears, a little DC motors, etc. So it's an early tachymetric design that directly measures the aircraft's ground speed and direction. 
The further improvements implemented an analog computer that continuously recalculated the bomb's impact point based on changing flight conditions. Together, these features promised unprecedented accuracy. Didn't turn out that way. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about some of that. Should talk to that too. Norton was granted the utmost sec sec uh, secrecy going into the war. The bombardiers were issued 45 caliber pistols to use on the bomb site first and then themselves if there was fear that the enemy would get a hold of that bomb site. It was a serious oath they took. Very serious. Under combat conditions, however, the Norton bomb site did not achieve its expected precision, yielding an average CEP of, in 1943 of 1,200 feet. When the error calculation was predicted to be 75. So, the procedure was to improve that by adopting an area some would call carpet bombing techniques for ever larger groups of aircraft. So, the more airplanes you have, the wider the area. Okay, so you don't just hit that point, you hit that point plus a lot of other things. But the Norton bomb site was actually used in post-World War II um, after radar-based targeting was introduced. The last combat use of the Norton was in the United States Navy dropping of sensors under the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It was late as 1967. The Norton bomb site remains one of the best-known bomb sites ever invented, however. Okay. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of these pictures here. The one on the left, this is the inside. Obviously, it's a Victoria, but if you've ever been up in the nose of a B-17, you know, feel this when you look at it. A couple things that strike you right away. Look at the clothing they're wearing. Temperatures at these altitudes, 23 to 28,000 feet, typical bomb run altitudes, anywhere between 50 and 70 below zero Fahrenheit. The plane is not heated. People get frostbite. People die from freezing. Especially in the back section. See the glass here? Bugs of glass? Sunlight coming through there. It's the warmest point on the airplane. They actually many times would not wear their electrical suits that kept them warm. They would sit on those so they could survive there. Man has his hand back, the navigator, the bombardier, by the way, is the person at the front looking over the bomb site. The navigator sits right there. They both have what we call cheek guns as well. That's not a G-model airplane. But when he raises his hand like that, typically he's on target or he's already dropped the bombs. Okay? On the right-hand side, uh, Sid touched on this, but the the device on the right. Where am I? Yeah, thank you. The ball, the football. What is it with this one? Okay, this is a sight head. That's what this guy is right here. This is a sight head. This is what we're going to be looking through. Okay. This particular one has this device up here. You don't see it on this one. Okay. And this one, you can actually, the bombardier would be sitting and you can look straight through here and there's a mirror here. This site picks up the what you see there off the mirror, which we're going to see in a little bit, and he can look at it this way. So it's a much more comfortable arrangement, which was thought to add accuracy to this because they didn't have to be standing over this thing all the time. So this is a, uh, a reflex site, okay? They didn't all have it. The next piece up there is the stabilizer. So when this bomb site is put in, in the uh, in the unit in the aircraft, it's attached to this electrically. Okay. This stabilizer is going to pass these communications on to another device, which I'm going to show you soon. A lot of knobs, 2,000 parts, precision. I think the decide that the, 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 the product was precision. But I want to make a point here.
when you're flying that high and you're cold, you're being bounced around in the skies and you don't have protection yet, and the 88 millimeter flak's coming up, burning planes, your buddy's falling out of the sky, you know it, you hear him screaming. I don't know how you can concentrate. And oh, by the way, most formations had a lead bombardier and two more bombardiers. So the lead bombardier was here, and then you had a left deputy and a right deputy, oh, usually up here. So if this guy went out, this guy moved in, and conversely, okay? They were the only three planes in a group that would have bomb sites. All the rest of them were toggles. You have the bombs, bombers, bomb, excuse me, the bombardiers up there ready on the levers. They looked ahead when the bomb bay doors opened, they would open theirs. And when the bombs would drop, they would drop theirs. And so you have this massive coverage as you're flying along. Just boom, 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 boom. This is hit and everything else. Okay, some devices here. They're part of this whole process of precision bombing. This is looking at the instrument cluster on RG model B-17, this Angela over here in the, in the B-17 hangar. This device right here, right here, and right here, is called PDI, it's a pilot direction indicator. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. But what that does is, as the bombardier is managing the, the bomb site, it's telling that, that pilot, you need to move the airplane, you need to turn it. We're going to be flat, but you're going to rubber turn this airplane. That's the only indication that the pilot has that he is on track or off track or whatever it is. There's the bomb site attached again, sitting in front of that V shaped glass. It's optically flat. So you can see through that without distortion. There's a reflex sight. All right. This right here is connected to this, which is this. This is a C1 autopilot. It sits between the two pilots right here. And this is the thing that's going to hold the plane in its track until it's changed by the bomb site. It's pretty similar to what we use today, only it's, what, 80 years old? But it does the same thing. It holds the plane in position. This right here, I'm going to get to, but this is a tachometer. Why in the world would we need a tachometer? Well, I'm going to show you in another slide or two. This is where some of this precision comes in. This is a seven-minute film. This is an authentic training film from 1942 on the bomb site. It's a real segment. It gives you an idea of how they train the young bombardier and how the bomb site works. First, there's a gyroscope, which makes it possible to stabilize the telescope in a vertical position. So that no matter how the airplane rolls or pitches, you have a fixed vertical line of reference. Then, to take care of the sighting line, there's a rotating mirror underneath the telescope. You can see that's the same as having the telescope rotate. That means, since the mirror is connected to an indicator, we can see just how fast our sighting angle is closing as we approach the target. All right, what else goes into your diagram? First, altitude. Only put it down as disk speed. I'll put it down that way for now. You'll figure out why in a minute. And you know your airspeed. That's constant, too. So that tells you how far behind the airplane your bomb will fall. That's your trail. 
track trail from your whole range. That's how far the airplane travels after the bomb is released. And you have actual range. That means you've got your range angle, the most important thing of all. Because when your sighting angle equals that range angle, that's when the sight releases the bomb. Well, first there's our vertical line of reference, which the gyro stabilizes for us. Watch that sighting angle. Notice how it speeds up as it closes to zero, instead of moving down at an even rate like a stopwatch. Now, suppose the distance from A to B is the whole range. Forget trail for the moment. Even though the sighting angle does speed up for a given altitude and a given speed, there can be only one specific rate of closing. Find that rate and from it the sight will compute the range angle. Look, there's a disc inside the sight rotated by a constant speed motor. Once you get on the target manually by turning your rate knob, you move a roller toward or away from the center of the disc. The further from the center, the faster the roller turns. That means the telescope mirror is driven faster or slower according to the position of the roller. You turn your rate knob backwards or forwards until you found the rate of drive at which the line of sight will stay on the target by itself. It's from the position of the roller when this is accomplished that the sight computes the range angle. You've done all this merely by adjusting the rate knob to keep the crosshairs on the target. But does the rate index now give you the correct range angle? No, it doesn't, because you haven't allowed for trail. You allow for trail before you attempt to synchronize. That's what the trail arm is for. When you start your run, you've already set your trail at the correct reading for your airspeed and the type of bomb you're using. By doing this, you move the roller independently of the rate indicator. Since this means you speeded up your rate of drive beforehand, this calls for a different adjustment of your rate knob and rate indicator to achieve synchronization. In other words, before we start measuring our rate of angular closing, we preset our rate mechanism to allow for the difference between whole and actual range. Does that take care of everything? Remember, we're dealing in angular velocity, the rate of the closing of the sighting angle. Suppose that represented an airplane flying at 10,000 feet altitude. Now, suppose you were flying at only 5,000 feet, but still at the same speed. In that case, you have only half as long for the sighting angle to close to zero. Therefore, the rate of closing must be twice as great. In other words, the angular velocity of closing varies inversely with the altitude. So, before you try to synchronize, you set in the proper disk speed for the altitude you're bombing from. Then, when you clutch in and synchronize with your rate knob, the bomb site gives you the correct rate angle setting for the particular altitude at which you're flying. After that, the bomb site does the rest. Including this. So now you understand how the range problem is solved by the bomb site. Remember how the site's made in two parts? Underneath, there's the stabilizer. And in that, there's another gyro, only it has a horizontal axis. Above that is your sight. The stabilizer is fixed in the longitudinal axis of the airplane. But you can keep turning the sight so that it's always pointing at the target. But the sight is also connected to the stabilizer by rods. By these, the gyro controls the position of the sight so that no matter how much the airplane yaws, the sight will always point in the same direction. But, and this is what's important here, the gyro gives you a constant reference in asthma. And imagine there's a plane just below you on a bombing run. Okay, here's what it would look like. There it is, and you can see its ground track. All right. The bombardier has picked up the target, and he's clutched in his stabilizer. Now, suppose he uses his turn knob to correct for drift. That means he turns the sight and the airplane equal amounts. Well, that didn't get him anywhere. You can see he's still drifting. So now he turns the plane faster than he turns the sight. Until finally his sight line and his ground track coincide. 
In other words, he's established the correct drift angle, and he's on a path parallel to the collision course. Look. There's the plane flying over the target on a collision course. You can see where the bomb drops. Cross trail distance downwind. And here's another plane coming the same way. Only when it starts to set up its drift angle, it begins to head further upwind. Until finally it's on a course parallel to the collision course, but cross trail distance upwind. What's the matter? Doesn't it seem so simple now? Well, don't let it worry you. Sure, you'll have to learn what all those knobs and switches are for. But it's still the same question of when to drop your bombs and how to get on course. Okay, so I'm going to kind of talk you through a bomb run. And I have to recognize this person up in the left-hand corner. There was a, there was a uh, dosa here on the Friday shift, uh, B-17, uh, Alex Ranfold, and he was a bombardier. He did 34 missions into Germany. They were shot down twice, both times, both right engines. And he survived it all. 34 missions. And so he taught me a lot about how he did things. Very interesting. He also flew all of his missions in what they called the Big League then. The most highly defended areas of Germany is what they flew into. And he survived it. 34 missions. Now, to start with, you're going to have bombing tables. You're going to select your altitude and your true airspeed. When you get up to altitude, you set your true airspeed. That, then, is the basis of your disk speed, right here. You heard it say disk speed. What's disk speed? It is going to be the computation rate of an angular velocity for the bomb drop. So, one of the, about 20 minutes or so before we actually get to the IP. The IP is the initial point of the bomb run. We're not flying towards our target. We're flying towards an IP. And about 20 minutes previous to that, the navigator will say 20 minutes to IP. Okay, we gotta get going. When we get to the IP, we're gonna turn. But what happens is the bombardier starts this way. He's going to energize this thing. He's going to stabilize the gyro. He's going to uncage the gyro. He tells the commander of that aircraft, I want the plane flat now. The pilot's going to do everything he can to level this plane. No roll, no pitch, no yaw. And he's going to come in here. The bombardier is going to adjust this, this gyro so that it's flat. Okay, and now we're going to lock in that position. You saw it up there, it needs to stay. So when that plane does this, this sighting here will stay level. I'm looking. The plane can do this, but I'm looking. The other thing that has to happen is I have to set my disk speed. My disk speed is the speed, and we have to set our trail. Is it before we get to the IP? Okay, so things are happening pretty fast now. So we're going to set the disk speed right here. You heard him. You saw him. There's a number. It comes from the book. I'm going to turn it here. But how do I know that's really the right speed? Remember the tachometer? I've got an output shaft right here in the receiver. I'm going to take that tachometer and I'm going to put it in there. And that has to register a specific tach speed. If it's not there, I'm going to make another adjustment. When I finally get there, I'm going to do it two more times. If that repeats, then that's the disk speed I want, regardless of what this number actually says. But my bomb, when it drops, it drops like this, right? It doesn't go like this. You saw them up there, so we have to count, compute for that. So from empirical data of dropping bombs, not a computation, we know that a 500 pound GP bomb dropped to a certain altitude is gonna drop here.
it changes that angular speed, that is the point where we're going to drop. Now, now what do we know? We know when we're going to drop the bomb. What we don't know is, where is the target? They don't know that. So the bomb site set up, it's ready. It's coupled with the, the stabilizer. The stabilizer is coupled with the C1 autopilot. So now we got we got two minutes to turn. We have two minutes to IP, so we're gonna turn. We're gonna turn anywhere, anywhere from a 15 to a 25 degree angle. Slow, basically a standard rate type turn. Very slow. Now where we end up is where? Hopefully we're looking right at the target somewhere out there, but maybe not. So what the bombardier will do, what Alex would do, he would take this head, the sighting head, and turn it. So you try and look, you had all his maps, you've seen his maps, you've seen the routes, you've seen the buildings, you've seen the great big lakes, and whatever his landmarks were. He's going to try and find this, okay? And pretty soon he finds it, okay? And he's pointing out the window like this, and the plane's going like this. Do you remember on the instrument cluster there was a PDI, pilot direction indicator? The needle has shifted one way or the other, and if anybody's a pilot has used a VOR, you know what a course deflection indicator is? The pilot is slowly going to move toward the needle until the needle winds up. Now the airplane and the bomb site are essentially synced in and going on the bomb run. Now, this is your displacement knob for the horizontal um, crosshair on the mirror. This one is the rate, and this is your drift. The wind's blowing you this way, I've got to correct for drift. So what I'm going to do, pretty much have my course now, okay? So I'm going to go out there, all of a sudden I see my target out there. There it is, right out there, okay? This is pretty much the way I'm going to be. I'm going to, I'm going to forget this for the moment. I'm pretty much going to be like this. This wouldn't be here. I'm done like this. And I'm watching this. I see my target out there. So the outer one here, I want to go to my target. So I'm going to take my, I'm going to rotate that right. I'm going to get my crosshair up close to that target. Okay. Then I'm going to take this drift knob and I'm going to drift that airplane. I'm going to curl it to the degree that that, that the vertical comes in on that target too. Now, once I get close enough to the target, I'm going to turn this right knob. This is a right knob that's attached to a, uh, DC motor, variable speed, and I'm going to take that, so right there, that point right there, I've taken my, my mirror, I've turned my mirror so that the horizontal uh, crosshair is like this. Now I want to range in on that. And I'm going to start turning this inner knob. So I come up like this, and now all of a sudden I'm going to go to it, and I'm going to set the range exactly the same rate as I'm flying. So the mirror now is turning exactly the same way that I'm flying, okay? And to keep that, I have to be on this the whole time. Constantly just tweaking, 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 tweaking. Now when I set the range, excuse me, when I set the, the, uh, uh, the trail, there's two indices here. There's an indice here, there's an index here and an index here. When I set the trail, there's one right here. You can come up later and check, check this out. There's another one though that is following my trail or my travel to the target. Once that angular velocity above the target becomes the same as what I had set up previously, these, these indexes, the indices will actually come together. When they come together, bam, bombs away, bombs away. And then the planes behind you will begin dropping theirs as well. Okay, that pretty much completes a bomb run if you actually found your target, which sometimes it didn't. Sometimes they were being knocked around. And as time went along and, the, and, the, and the, the little friends with the P-51s could follow them all the way to the targets and back, accuracy actually started to, to improve. My contention has always been, it's not just the bomb site that was inaccurate. When you're in combat conditions like that, how can you be so accurate? You might not even see your target. In fact, they had tertiary targets uh, uh, 
secondary targets and tertiary targets to drop the bomb time if they missed their target. There were times when some of them actually made, can you imagine, 24 or more airplanes coming back around trying to find that target because they knew that was their mission? Can you imagine if they, the 109s and the 190s are still up there and have plenty of ammo, plenty of 20 millimeter cannon fire left? You didn't stand much of a chance. So it was very dangerous. The whole missions were dangerous. I just want to show, so this is what I've learned from Alex, how he did it, um, the complexities of it, and uh, of course, the longer they, they served and handled this, the better they got at it. He was stationed at the 379th Bomb Group in Kimbolton. He did 34 missions, as I mentioned, just for perspective, that's an aerial view of that air base in 1942, late 42. And just as reference is, you see England, just a reference to where he would be roughly in the, on the island. I just wanted to show you that, just to give you some perspective. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, let's go to the next one. That was a big question, I think. Okay, here's the, other, here's the last thing I want to bring up. So, there are 25, the upper gear is at 25,000 feet. Bottom gear is about 8,000 feet. Work the bomb along the cathedral in Formal German. Okay? If you look at the top one, five miles distance between those two tacks, um, tacks, yellow tacks, so 25,000 feet, do you think you could really find that thing out there? Do you think you could really be flying at 200 miles an hour indicator or two airspeed and you could pick up any real? You know, is there a lake? What is there? So there's a scope in here. And if I remember Alex, I think it was about a three power scope. So the equivalent to that, in other words, here's a mile distance at an altitude of 8,000 feet. You can see the top of the cathedral. By the way, if you've never been there, it is well worth your time. It's a beautiful structure. Those two spires up there are each 515 feet in the air above ground. And what the, we dropped bombs, 14 hits on that cathedral bombing Germany, but what we discovered was, this is a magnificent landmark. We can see through smoke, low level uh, um, clouds, uh, what do I want to call it? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, anything low level, below 500 feet, that's what the only thing you can see. So it was a landmark. So we stayed away from that, except for looking for it and knowing exactly where we were. Okay? So, the Twin Spires are said to have been used as an easily recognizable navigational landmark by Allied aircraft raiding deeper into Germany in the later years of the war, which may be the reason that the cathedral is not destroyed. I have German friends over there, they took me through there. That was the reason, they believe, because that was the only landmark, everything else on to the ground. Anybody have any questions on that? So, you know, you have to look at this, this one over here on the, on the look at the five mile one. Imagine you're five, you're 25,000 feet up in the air and looking down. 25,000 feet and looking down. 8,000 feet, three power stroke or so. You, you can actually see that. You're only, here you're only 8,000 feet in the air, so you can actually see out there. So I think Sid mentioned how difficult it might be able to see things down there. It was. And I think that's a lot of problems. Were a lot of reasons for misses. Um, so that's my speculation. Um, that's really it for me. Uh, now I want to talk about what the bomb site was and why air first, what it wasn't. North bomb site was a good bomb site for its day. It was a technological marvel, but its day was in the late teens and the, right in the late twenties and the early thirties. So it didn't uh, it didn't have the advantage of a lot of the technology that was developed during the war, pre war And as, as he said, you had to have a visible target. Well, the weather in Germany doesn't always cooperate with you. And also, when you start bombing something like a refinery, 
you're going to get a lot of smoke. If you can't see the target, you can't hit it. It was a good bomb sight in the hands of a skilled bombardier flown by an expert pilot. And that's why Steve mentioned that, that General Curtis LeMay, out of desperation, took his three best pilots and his three best bombardiers and put them in the front of the formation. And the rest was just hit the top of the switch. Sure. That picture is interesting because that is a G model B-17. The reason I know that is because of the sight. G models have the chin turret like ours does. So the sight, the bombardier or the navigator could stand here and sight the aircraft. On the right hand side you see that piece sitting over there. That's the fire control. It would come around and snap. And those things were aligned so the gunner could stand here and fire that chin turret at approaching aircraft. As Steve mentioned, you had to have a stable bombing platform. And you're getting shot at with anti-aircraft fire and 20 millimeter cannons and whatever else the Germans are throwing at you. That airplane is bouncing all over the place. And just to go back and look at this picture, the bombardier is in some sort of a contortionist position trying to make all kinds of adjustments and read all kinds of data. The airplane's bouncing up and down. The one they hit it. And the, the bomb site had to be well maintained. These things were basically hand-built by German craftsmen. And so no two were exactly alike. Also, Norton was a mechanical engineer. He distrusted electricity, especially alternating current electricity. So everything electrical in the bomb site was DC, direct current. But the problem was that the carbon brushes and the DC motors and gyros would come up the rest of the works. So they were constantly being, having to be maintained. And the technicians that did the maintenance were some of the best in the Army Air Force. How accurate was it really? Well, 5% of the 8th Air Force bomb land within 1,000 feet of the target. The average for a 500 pound bomb was almost 2,000 feet. In fact, here's Major Paraby who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, who was probably the best bombardier in, in the Army Air Force. And he was flown by Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who was definitely the best bomber pilot in the Air Force, in ideal conditions, and they still missed the target by 800 feet. But close away counts in the first use of atomic bombs. Bomb results never lived up to the in of the Norton bomb site. So why all the hype? Oh, well, I should have had this explain this picture before. The Army, because of the poor accuracy, finally gave up on precision bombing and went to saturation bombing, sometimes called terror bombing. Okay, why the hype? The doctrine of precision bombing. This was a doctrine that says, well, you gotta remember that this, everybody still has World War I in mind, the, the terrible things that were going on in the trenches, and the civilian population before the war was totally against any kind of involvement, any kind of war, right? So the U.S. Army Air Force was looking for a mission to separate itself from the U.S. Army, because the Army was all, was run by ground forces generals, who thought the only function of an airplane was to protect the men on the ground. So the doctrine of precision bombing says, bomb only military and industrial targets until the enemy has lost the ability to wage war. We won't kill civilians, we'll only bomb military and industrial targets. Armies will not have to fight on the ground like World War I, and civilians will not get killed. And it was based on the fact that there's a hope that the bombers always get through, and they, by that time the B-17 was on the drawing board. So the thinking was, the B-17 will get fire, will be able to fly so high that it will avoid the anti-aircraft fire, and it will fly higher and faster than the enemy fighters, so it won't need fighter uh, escorts. Well, the Germans didn't cooperate. They came up with, came up with anti-aircraft fire that would go to 30,000 feet. They came up with fighters that would go faster and higher than the B-17, and 20-millimeter cannons that could lob cannon shells at the, at the bombers, out of range of the bombers' 50 caliber machine guns. And here's the tip. We will have a super accurate bomb site that makes this possible. That's why all the hype on the Northern bomb site. Not that it was that great, but they needed it to support the mission of precision bombing. And in fact, by the end of the war, the US Army Air Force was almost completely separate from the from the Army. General Hap Arnold was a five-star general. One of the few was a five-star general with more than one service. He was five-star general in the U.S. Army Air Force, 
and then later in the Air Force. But even though the Air Force, the Army Air Force was still part of the Army, Cap Arnold had a seat at the, at the uh, Joint Chiefs. So he, he had as much stature as the Army did. And this all went back to Billy Mitchell. When World War I actually proved, at least to his satisfaction, that aircraft could win battles by themselves. And one of his apostles was General Hap Arnold, who ended up running the Air Force. So this whole doctrine of precision bombing was more than anything a way to justify separating the Air Force from the Army. And in 1947, that's what happened. Some books you might want to read. This one. This has got incredible technical detail and history of the bomb sites. A series of books that talks about the doctrine of precision bombing. And I have these here with me if you want to get ISBN numbers or anything out of them. And other than that, thank you.